out the double doors to the terrace and down the back staircase. For anyone that has difficulty with stairs, please check with the marshal or our fire officials for assistance. Once outside, assemble on the northeast corner across the street from City Hall at Lewis and First. Employees wearing safety vests or our city marshals will inform you when it is safe to re-enter our building. For public comment related to the items on the agenda, citizen participation and public hearing items will have available a speaker card, which you can complete and submit to the city clerk. Cards are available in the city clerk's office or at the rear of the chambers. If you do not submit a card, it does not prevent you from speaking under public comment, citizens' participation, or specified public hearing items. If there is anyone present today that has a need for hearing impaired equipment, please see our city clerk staff. If you are parked in the parking garage across the street, a self-validation machine is located in the foyer between council chambers and the security desk you walk through to enter these chambers. You must have your ticket with you to use the machine. If you do not have your ticket, please see security personnel when exiting for a validation coupon. Before we proceed with the agenda, would everyone please rise for the invocation given by Reverend David Dandy from Mountain View Presbyterian Church. And please remain standing for our pledge. Uh, good morning, Mayor Pro Tem Fiore, City Council. Happy holidays. Now let us pray. Towards the week before Christmas and City Council is meeting, hello, dear God, from the City of Las Vegas, we bring a warm greeting. The council has been laboring very hard at work. We pray during the meeting, no one in the room acts like a jerk. The weather outside is delightful. Sometimes what's in our hearts is what is frightful. So instead of let it snow, let it snow, let it snow, let us glow, let us glow, let us glow. Starlight, star bright, may we be the city where no one feels a slight. Oh, what a sight. During the hustling and bustling holiday season, may our motives and actions of love and honor and glory be the reason. Let there be peace in the home, the city, and on earth. May every citizen of Las Vegas feel their eternal worth. Let there be peace in our heart. That's a great place to start. Let there be the peace you wish to see. Oh, dear Lord, let the peace begin with me. Amen. 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 Our pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So bad. Did you read your wine bottle? <laughs> no. Good morning. For our first ceremon ceremonial item today, Councilman Creer, who's all over the place, as usual, <laughs> is going to be recognizing our citizens of the month. Um, Councilman Creer, you think you can come up and do your job? Okay, here you go. Hey, you guys, how are you this morning? Hold on, we're going to make sure that the world knows that we're going to be honoring KCEP. So uh, we need to get our Facebook Live going, let everybody know who's not here, that they should be here. Very cool. Tania. Where? Thank you. See how organized we are? <laughs> So good morning. Uh, I'd like to take this time to recognize the Ward 5 Citizen of the Month. And we're doing something different this month. Instead of honoring an individual, 
we're honoring a group of individuals that work every day to make our community better and to make our community great. They've been doing it for a very long time. Um, and instead of honoring one individual, then we're going to honor an entire organization. And that's KCEP Power 88. KCP has made a huge contribution in the Las Vegas community, and on this day, we honor them for their deeds. I'd like to invite General Manager Craig Knight up to the podium, and actually, I want all you guys to come up, uh, not just Craig, but everybody who's affiliated with KCP, come on up and uh, join us at the podium. And I also want to wish my brother uh, Craig a happy birthday. Uh, belated, was it yesterday, two days ago? Yesterday. Happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all month. Happy, happy birthday. So KCP is finally known as the People Station, and it is a community-based, member-supported, nonprofit public radio station owned and operated by the Economic Opportunity Board uh, of Clark County, which is also known as EOB. KCP first hit the airwaves of Las Vegas on October 7th, 1972, with just 10 watts of power and a trailer located at the Golden West Shopping Center. Uh, VOB's sole purpose at that time was to bring awareness through broadcasting of its available programs and services for the local community. By the 1980s, KCP's community service and music popularity expanded, and its power grew to 5,000 watts, eventually reaching 10,000 watts by the 1990s. And in 2009, KCEP became one of the first few local radio stations to, to convert to high definition, HD radio, leading and pioneering the way in today's norm in the digital broadcasting market. Over the past four decades, KCP has provided a platform for local community-based organizations to disseminate information to the at-risk and underserved communities throughout Las Vegas Valley. They also provide a vital link to a wide variety of news and information from housing, healthcare, politics, legal issues, education, real estate, insurance, finances, spirituality, entertainment, cultural arts, and public affairs. KCP provides more than 100,000 plus weekly listeners and an additional 80,000 plus digital streaming listeners with an eclectic blend of music genres from R&B, neo soul, hip hop, reggae, house, jazz, southern soul, blues, signature special program days like Take Me Back Tuesdays, which uh, provides the late 80s and 90s and early 2000s music. Everybody knows Classic Thursdays, which is uh, 60s, 70s, and early 80s music. And the all-day gospel on Sundays. If you want to listen to service and you want to listen to gospel, tune in 88.1 on Sundays and you will be uh, fulfilled. KCP has 25 inductees into the National Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame. And I'm going to mention them because it's important. In 1997, Bob Bailey and David Lee. 2000, Carolyn C.J. Bevel, 2001, Sherwood Bell, 2003, Brother Paul Gentile and Alice the Godmother, Tugwell, 2005, Pastor Sam Robertson, 2013, Carlea, the Queen of Flow, Lewis, and all over town, Chris Brown, uh, 2015, our own uh, County Commissioner Lawrence Weekly, Benzo Famous, uh, my Howard alum, Patricia Cunningham, Brother Elijah Pullins, Lanice Rogers, Nikki Scott, and Henry H.B. Black. 2017, our own general manager, Craig Smooth C. Knight, uh, Louis L. C. Connors Jr., Mark Melody, Leslie, Joy, Joy LaShawn, Gregory M. C. Drew, and Rufus Harrison. And then most recently in 2019, our dearly departed friend, Franklin G. Verley, Marlon DJ Thump, uh, Rice, and Danetta Ballin D. Coleman. I don't know, where's Ballin? Ballin is here. Residents tune in to KCP to get the latest and greatest information about events and happenings in the community. In fact, KCP's involvement epitomizes the spirit of community. And I would also like to mention that Power 8 has been a strong supporter of all of our Ward 5 events over the past couple of years. Uh, they graciously promote and partner with us to help ensure the success of our events. They have a huge reach in the community, and we look for them for assistance in spreading the word and to get information out to our residents about all of the activities we have going on within Ward 5 and also with the city. And so today, it is my privilege as the Ward 5 Councilman to honor them for their extraordinary involvement and service to our community. So I'm going to present a proclamation to you. 
Craig. Uh, and it says, KCP has a growing group of listeners throughout the United States and around the world, including uh, through the Power 88 app, website streaming, social media, digital platforms include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Power 88 TV streaming. And KCP is a proud affiliate of the African American Public Radio Consortium, the American Urban Radio Network, the Nevada Broadcast Association, Nevada Public Radio, community partners with the Las Vegas Urban Chamber of Commerce, the Sheriff's Metro Multicultural Advisory Council, the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee, the NAACP, and a host of local centers and organizations. And so now we recognize the huge impact KCP has made in the Las Vegas community, and we proudly recognize them as the Ward 5 Citizen of the Month. And so we, the mayor, members of the Las Vegas City Council, do hereby urge the entire community to join us as we proclaim December 18, 2019, KCEP Power 88 Day in the City of Las Vegas, Nevada. How about that? This is fantastic. I've been listening to KCP literally my entire life, and uh, it, it, it is just a, a something that is that has grown up with KCP. And you guys do so much, and it's a great day to recognize. So turn that around so everybody can see what you got going on. We're going to also, Craig, I'd like to give you a minute to talk up a little bit about what's going on at the station. Sure. Good morning, everyone. This is a great honor and a pleasure to be here. And I uh, first want to thank God for everything that he's done for KCEP and for us. Um, I, there are a lot of people that benefited from this radio station, whether you worked for the station or you was a supporter or a listener. And this station is so important to uh, this community and communities throughout the nation. And since we're digital, everyone can hear us. We have listeners all across the country and now all around the world. And we're in a unique position because this is such a transient city and we have so many visitors and a lot of times i'll say 90 percent of the times when you go to a new city what do you do you get in the rental car and you look for the radio station and people have found us and they've taken us with us all the way to europe africa australia everywhere we we get um we receive messages from people all over the world saying when it was in vegas they heard us and they loved us and they took us with them so with that being said, we want to thank the community because we are nothing without the community. And we do this for the love of it. And being that we're a nonprofit public radio station, we do it for the love of it. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't get that. We do it for the love of it because um, when it comes to community work, it's about the love of it. There's not a lot of money in it. So you have to do it for the love of it. And we okay with that because we love what we do and we do what we love. So we wanna thank everyone that supported. I wanna thank my staff that's up here and those that could not have made it. And um, it's very important because teamwork makes the dream work. And we all play a role in this, including the community. So this award is for everyone. And we wanna share it with everyone. So we thank you. We thank the city of Las Vegas. We thank the mayor and we thank the community. And with that being said, right. any questions? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. You know, this is great. Like I said, I grew up here in Las Vegas, and uh, it is something I listen to. My, I got my friend Terry Wade, who's here. Uh, he grew up here in Las Vegas, and I, I can't tell you how many times. Uh, Ballin's father was uh, DJ Hurt Him Bad. No, DC Ryder. DC, that's a Hurt Him Bad. DC Ryder. But that tells you how far I go back, though, right? I got heard him bad. I got D.C. Ryder. Uh, if you know, D.C. Ryder used to ride around the community with his van and, and host events and things going on. So uh, this is more than just a radio station. This is the community's station. And even further down, this is our community station. So uh, I, am, I am very uh, thankful for all the work that you guys have done that we do together in our community. So thank you guys very much. Uh, we're going to take a picture. Uh, don't forget Power 88. Tune in every day, 24-7, 365. Yes. Thank you. Let's take a picture. Shane in a oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a video? Ooh, my friend. Yeah, he's taking a picture. He'll, he'll. No, she's in the. Yeah. 
Go take yeah. a good picture. I'll send it to everybody. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's be, it. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank, thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Good job. Thanks. So is that 88 AM or FM? Yeah, FM. FM. On your right. FM dial. <laughs> <laughs> what a good looking group there. For our next ceremonial item today, I want to invite our planning director, Robert Summerfield, to join us at the podium. Okay. Our employees strive to meet our values of being kind, committed, and smart. And they work to build our community to make life better I am proud to announce that the Employee of the Month is Jorge Morteo. Jorge, will you please join us? Check that out. Jorge, congratulations. Jorge is a GIS analyst with our planning department and has been with the city since 2000. So 19 years, guys, almost 20 years. Sometimes government processes can be long and involved and it can become easy for our customers to get lost in red tape. Here at the city, we strive to cut through red tape and make the experience of doing business convenient and efficient. Jorge is a part of our success in this area. He is responsible for creating a new interactive map tool that serves as a one-stop shop for developers looking to build in our city. The map has multiple layers with parcel-based information about the general plan, zoning, land use entitlements, special area plans, and more. This map is of great assistance to the internal and external customers and comes at no additional cost to our fabulous city. Jorge, thank you for all that you do for our city and for improving our customer service. I am proud to name you our Employee of the Month and present you with this award. Where's my Vanna? You got to get the award. Yes. <laughs> Councilwoman Seaman is the Vanna today. <laughs> okay. I would like to give the opportunity to Robert Summerfield to say a few words and then we will hear from Jorge. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. So Jorge is one of those exceptional city employees who, in addition to his technical expertise as a senior uh, GIS analyst, is truly committed to what the city's values are, which are kind, committed, and smart. In addition to his, his work helping to make sure that the planning department and the constituents that we serve, both here at the council as well as the development and general public, he also spearheads uh, various efforts for mentorship. Um, when we talk about bringing young people in um, to very technical jobs and very city-oriented jobs, he works with a couple different programs that actually bring high school interns into our office every year, shows them what it means to work in an office environment, uh, work with the, the computers and some of the technical systems that the GIS team works with. So while I applaud everything he's done with the map, it's really his ability to be a mentor and be a leader um, in his field and within our department and within our city uh, that I applaud. And I thank the, uh, the Employee Engagement Committee for recognizing him as their, our Employee of the Month for the City of Las Vegas. So thank you, Jorge. Thank you for all of that. And thank you all. Jorge. Well, uh, thank you for selecting me the Employee of the Month uh, for the work I have done. But I'm going to read a little bit something here I put together. Uh, it really takes the support of other city co-workers. I would like to acknowledge all 14 City of Las Vegas geographic information systems uh, professionals, including a GIS pioneer, Robert Bob Agnew, that together, along with me, process dozens of records every day to provide vast amount of geographic information to the public, city officials, city departments, all the local uh, government entities, and most important, our emergency responders, fire, and police. Geographic information helps build a better city, allocate funds, let, let us make uh, smart decisions about our infrastructure and natural resources, drive economic growth by bringing millions of dollars into the city, and helps keep uh, our city safe. The GIS team is uh, one of the best in the nations. 
uh, the City of Las Vegas professionals have obtained multiple local, state, and national awards, including uh, uh, awards from the Environmental System Research Institute, where uh, we compete against other countries from, uh, from, every, from every continent, including a large organization like Geographic and National Geographic. Uh, um, I would like to thank the city management for continually providing us with uh, technical resources and training so we can, uh, we can do our jobs, but mostly for the UR Rich program uh, to bring a local, uh, uh, talented local uh, high school and uh, college students so they can work with us and they can become the future uh, yes, professionals in the city. And they can have the same opportunities that I had uh, 23 years ago when I was a, a college student intern. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's take a picture. Come here, Jorge. Congratulations, Jorge. For our final item, Councilwoman Seaman is going to recognize a community partner bringing awareness to fight against our human trafficking. Councilwoman Seaman. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So I'm very proud to honor Awareness is, is Prevention and their president, Lena Walther, for the work that they are doing to fight human trafficking. Would you come up, please, Lena? So Lena is a dual citizen of the United States and Sweden. She is currently honorary Swedish consul to Nevada. She has an extensive background in international relations that began with her service in the Royal Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Lena is the president and co-founder of the anti-human trafficking organization Awareness is Prevention. She became involved after intervening and rescuing two separate Swedish nationals held captive. Awareness is Prevention was created to educate the public on all forms of human trafficking. They do this by sponsoring events, concerts, and lectures that are designed to reach the youth who are the most vulnerable to human trafficking, as well as their parents and protectors to educate them on the dangers. Other services they provide, including promoting the sponsorship of safe houses, rehabilitation centers, and special clinics for treating traumatized victims. They also will provide training classes for both law enforcement as well as civilians on how to spot trafficked victims. With the explosion of human trafficking across the nation, it is vital to have organizations like Awareness is Prevention dedicated to ending human trafficking. So Lena, on behalf of the city of Las Vegas, we would like to thank you and your entire team for the great work you do. I'm gonna have you say a few words. Thank you so much, Victoria. Well, it's a great honor to receive this award. We have been working on teaching awareness for six years now. And in the beginning, when I was going out speaking to different groups, the comment I heard every time was, I had no idea. I had no idea. Same comment everywhere. Now when I'm out speaking, 
I hear, yes, we know there is a problem. And I'm very glad to see that people are becoming more aware because we cannot prevent this unless we know what we're supposed to prevent us from. And awareness is key. And we are now in the school district, Clark County School District. We are training police forces. We are training anywhere we can and would like to be the primary training organization for anyone who would like to learn more and how to prevent this. And Las Vegas, unfortunately, is a hub, and the human trafficking and sex trafficking of minors is an epidemic all over the United States, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Let's do a quick story. So let's get half on this side. Yeah. Come half. On over. Come on this side. Half. Oh, we should have introduced yeah. your husband and your yeah. 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 Come on over. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Come on this side. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's good to be now? tall. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sneak in and look at the pink shirt over there. <laughs> Thank you so much. One more, one more. Sorry. Thank you. We really appreciate We're going to take a couple of minutes now and reorganize, and we will start City Council promptly. Check, check, check.
Good morning. Welcome to City of Las Vegas. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. The amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. All comments made will be cross-referenced to those specific items. If anyone submitted a speaker card or who wishes to speak under this portion of the agenda, please come to the podium and state your name for the record. This is your opportunity to address the council, but the council is not able to respond or engage in dialogue. We'll set the time at one minute. Thank you, let's move on to agenda item number nine. For possible action, any items from the 9 a.m. session that the council staff and or applicant wish to be stricken, tabled, withdrawn, or held in abeyance to a future meeting may be brought forward and acted upon at this time. Councilwoman Seaman. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. The following items have been requested to be held in abeyance, withdrawn, tabled, or stricken. 9 a.m. session, item number 14, business impact statement relating to bill number 2019-52, request to strike by Mayor Pro Tem Fiore. Item 49, disposition and development agreement between Southern Land Company and City Parkway V, Inc. for the sale and development of parcel D in Symphony Park. Request for abeyance to January 15, 2020, requested by staff. And item 53, resolution authorizing City Parkway V to sell parcel D within Symphony Park. Request for abeyance to January 15th, 2020, requested by staff. And item 56, bill number 2019-44, regarding authorization for the determination and designation of hours for cleaning public sidewalks, request for abeyance to January 15, 2020, requested by Mayor Goodman. Item number 59, bill number 2019 Dash 48 regarding the repeal of LVMC 19.16-105 pertaining to the repurposing of certain golf courses and open spaces. Request for abeyance to January 15, 2020. Requested by me, Councilwoman Seaman. Item number 63, bill number 2019-52 regarding establishing Re regulations pertaining to the collection of commercial source separated recyclables and construction or demolition waste. Request to strike by Mayor Pro Tem Fiore. And that will be my motion. Thank you, there's a motion on the floor, please vote. Let's post. And that motion carries. For possible action to approve the final minutes by reference of the November 6th and 20th, 2019, regular City Council meetings. Councilwoman Seaman, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I move to approve the minutes of the November 6th and 20th, 2019, City Council meetings. Let's vote on the motion and post. And that motion carries. Items number 11 through 48, with the exception um, on the consent agenda, are considered to be routine and are recommended for approval by the departments and may be enacted in one motion. Note, a correction to item number 40, as it should reflect the contract extension date to June 30th, 2022. The contract itself has the correct extension date. Councilwoman Seaman, I understand you wish to make a comment regarding item 12. I do, Madam Mayor, thank you. Put Madam your mic Mayor on. Pro Tem. Put your mic on. Oh, okay. hold on. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. We end the year with the biggest request yet for Badlands litigation money $350,000, which is in addition to the 100,000 we just approved two weeks ago. This hole just keeps getting bigger and deeper and we have to find a way out. I am committed to finding a solution that resolves this 
in a way that finally ends this and allows the city and my ward to move forward. But until we have the solutions, I need to support the city in its defense of these lawsuits and will be supporting this request. Thank you, Councilwoman Seaman. Are there any consent items the council wishes to bring forward? Seeing none, Councilwoman Seaman, may I have a motion for the consent? For the Madam, oh, yeah, go ahead. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I move to approve items 11 through 48 with the exception of item 14. Please vote and please post. That motion carries. Agenda item number 50, discussion for possible action to accept the City of Las Vegas Comprehensive Annual, um, annual Financial Report for physical year ending June 30th, 2019. All awards, Mrs. Appleyard. Ms. Appleyard. Good morning, Vanetta Appleyard, Director of Finance for the City of Las Vegas. The item you have before you is to, uh, is to accept the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the City of Las Vegas. NRS requires that we have an audit performed by a CPA firm and that report be accepted by the Council. This year, our audit was performed by Percy Bowler, Taylor, and Kern, and we received an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion, which means our financial statements fairly present the financial position of the city in all material respects. I want to thank the finance department for all the work that they did, along with Percy Bowler and Taylor's and Kern's audit team. Uh, this is a big project for, this, for the finance department and it's a big deliverable, so I wanna thank them for all the efforts that they did for us. Um, with that, I have with me Tom Donahue, who is the managing partner for Piercy Bowler, Taylor and Kern, and he will give you some more details regarding the audit. Thank you, Vanetta. Good morning, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council. Uh, Tom Donahue, as Vanetta said, managing partner of, I just say PBTK, it's easier to say. Um, uh, we've, as Vanetta said, we've completed our audit, uh, fiscal 19 audit of the city of Las Vegas and have issued our unmodified opinion on the financial statements and on compliance uh, with grant regulations. As part of the audit, we also uh, looked at the city's internal control over financial reporting and noted no reportable matters uh, regarding those internal controls. Uh, and also issued an unmodified opinion on the city's compliance with grant uh, contract requirements for federal spending. Um, as part of your meeting materials, you have our required communications letter, which is a formal communication uh, to those charged with governance, in this case the city council, as it relates to matters pertaining to the audit. I'll call to your attention some of this uh, high level communications. The audit resulted in no significant adjustments to the city's financial statements. No difficulties or contentious matters were encountered. There were no disagreements with management who cooperated fully and we received all information requested during the audit. No um, reportable matters involving internal control were noted. No fraud or illegal activities are noted during the audit. And uh, no reportable instances of non-compliance with laws, regulations, or contracts. Um, I'd like to again thank uh, the city's finance department, uh, Ms. Appleyard and her team for their cooperation letting us disrupt their lives during the audit. Um, we sincerely appreciate the cooperation extended to us during the audit and I'd be happy to discuss any questions that council or mayor pro tem may have as it relates to the audit. Well, seeing no questions up here, may I have a motion, Councilman Seaman? I most move to approve. There's a motion on the floor. Please vote and post. Thank you. Thanks. Happy holidays. Do you know what Councilman Anthony's wine bottle says? He is very, very bad. He's not paying attention. Okay. Motion passes. Agenda item 51, discussion for possible action regarding naming a new park at 4480 East Washington Avenue at East Las Vegas Family Park, Ward 3 in Councilwoman Diaz's ward. Mr. Weitzel or 
Mr. Schultz and Mr. Weitzel. You want to introduce me? Sure. Uh, here to discuss this proposal is Larry Schultz, our co-chair, or I'm sorry, vice chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you, Greg. Um, just we'll, we'll sure. We can just switch mm -hmm. places here. Okay. Uh, good morning, Council. Good morning, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. It's good to be here again. And uh, today we have a good event, which is the naming of one of our new parks in the city. And I think it's a real gem, and we'll share that with you in a minute. Um, we'll start off by thanking Councilwoman Diaz because uh, her, her and her team provided amazing support to the park and to get the park moving and to get the, communi the community is very excited about it. And also thank you to all of the city staff leaders and their teams because they did a tremendous job in creating this park with the contractors. And we recently had a grand opening. We have a little photo from the grand opening. Can, are we showing the photo? Good. Uh, let me just move the microphone out of the way. And you can see in the photo uh, the ribbon cutting. And what was so exciting was when the ribbon cutting was uh, initiated, all the children and their families, which you can't see all of them in this photo, this is just a limited slice, all rushed up to the ribbon with massive excitement. So I, I kind of enjoyed that, watching that, because it said that, hey, this was really something the community really, really wanted. And you can see the other photo there of the play area. So indeed, having seen a lot of the uh, parks uh, within the city, uh, I'm very proud of this Ward 3 park. It's, it's wonderful. And uh, so we're here today then to discuss uh, the, name, uh, the naming of the park and uh, a little bit of background. In order to, in, to name the park, uh, the count, Councilwoman Diaz and her staff did a very good outreach to the local community. So they actually did a lot of outreach methods, including social media, and most important, knocking door to door and talking to people. And one of the common things that came out of that outreach effort is a lot of names were recommended, but a lot of the names had the word family in it. So family was the common denominator. And then on top of that, uh, we are obviously in East Las Vegas, and that's kind of a historic community. And there's other resources within that community, like the East Las Vegas Library and the East Las Vegas Community Center. So those, those facilities are used extensively by the community members. So when you combine East Las Vegas and the word family, what do you come up with? East Las Vegas Family Park. And so that was the name selected by the councilwoman and recommended to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission at its regular uh, December 3rd meeting. And uh, the uh, commission was absolutely excited about that name and supported that name 100 plus percent, and we approved it at that time. So at this time, uh, we're excited and, and uh, we, uh, would like to recommend, we recommend to the council that based on our unanimous con, uh, consent and approval at the last commission meeting, that you indeed accept and approve that name for this new uh, first class park, which is the East Las Vegas Family Park, which is located on East Washington near Lamb Boulevard. And with that, uh, I thank you, council, for your consideration, and I leave it in your good hands. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Schultz. Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. And as Mr. Schultz mentioned, my team and I did um, seek the input from our community in Ward 3 to um, land on this name. And I hope that everyone's ex as excited as we all were the day we opened the park. We had many children and families come as a result of our efforts going door to door to spread the word to come and join us for the ribbon cutting. Um, and I think that I've already received notifications, the lights are out, uh, things are happening, and uh, I know they're gonna continue to enjoy uh, that park, that in that part of the ward, the community was very thirsty to have that kind of a, 
uh, a space for families to take their children, enjoy the outdoors, and um, just um, feel like uh, they don't have to travel much farther than just crossing the street because literally there are apartment complexes and townhomes right across the street from it. So with that, I move to approve the name East Las Vegas Family Park for this newly um, fabulously built um, park, which I want to commend the city staff for making sure that it was planned and it was um, you know, carried out and it turned out beautifully. Thank you, Councilwoman Diaz. Let's vote on the motion and post. Thank you, and that motion carries on to agenda item number 52, resolutions R49-2019, discussion for possible action regarding a resolution of the Las Vegas City Council regarding the implementation of a flat cost-based construction permit fee of 1372 for the installation of a small wireless facility on or upon city rights away by the providers of telecommunication services and by companies that entitle, construct, and provide telecommunications infrastructure for telecommunications provider all wards. Ms. Bishop. Good morning, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. For the record, I'm Gina Bishop, Franchise Officer in the Finance Department. The item before you is a resolution in response to the September 26, 2018 Federal Communications Commission order regarding broadband and infrastructure deployment. The FCC order preempts certain aspects of local regulatory authority over small wireless facilities but allows the city to regulate aesthetic requirements and set permit fees based on actual costs. To address these new regulations, the Council adopted a resolution establishing aesthetic requirements on December 19, 2018, which also included a form agreement to be used when negotiating the attachment of telecommunications equipment to public property, which includes small wireless facilities in the city's rights of way and on city-owned structures, and the costs associated with those attachments. The form agreement has streamlined the city's application process, making it simpler and easier to deploy the latest wireless technology throughout the city. Instead of a percentage-based construction permit fee, this resolution would implement a flat cost-based construction permit fee of $1,372 for the installation of a small wireless facility. This fee is set in an amount that approximates the estimated actual cost to the city for receiving, reviewing, and inspecting a proposed permit for such installation in accordance with the rules imposed by the FCC, which mandates that costs for upfront fees associated with such construction permitting be fair, reasonable, and cost-based if the fee does not comply with the safe harbor provided by the FCC. The city believes the new flat fee for such construction permitting to be fair, reasonable, and the approximate cost of services rendered. Here to assist me in creating this record are Deputy City Attorney Jim Lewis and staff from both Building and Safety and Public Works. Um, Deputy Jim Lewis will now speak more about the FCC rules and the reason for this amendment to the resolution and fees, and we will all be available to answer any questions afterward. Thank you. Hi, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Lewis, I'm a Deputy City Attorney with the City. Um, my job here is to uh, briefly describe the resolution for you. I'm going to help create the record that we need, and then I'm here to answer any questions at the end. Um, Basically, the resolution generally acts to adopt, like she said, the $1,372 construction permit fee for small wireless facilities attached in our right of way. It does establish that this fee is for each attachment. It does establish that it only charges the flat fee within our rights of way when traffic engineering is reviewing and inspecting the plans in addition to land development. Uh, this fee it also establishes this fee is not charged if a carry needs to do routine maintenance as defined in the resolution itself. The reason we want to create this record is that in 2019, the Federal Communication Commission adopted new rules that act to severely limit local government power to regulate the placement of these new, f these new 5G technologies on city property, which are basically streetlights and light posts. 
and also the amount of money we can charge for either A, upfront construction permitting, and B, annually recurring rental charges. This resolution has only to address the upfront construction permit fees. We're here to make a record to show that such fee is fair, reasonable, and the approximate cost of services rendered by the city. As Gina mentioned, we addressed aesthetics in a prior action in December 2017, and we do address recurring costs when negotiating individual site rental agreements with the providers. City staff developed a methodology to analyze the true actual cost of services rendered, and staff will be up after me to go over these costs and make up the proposed construction permit fee of $1,372. For the record, the city staff has been working with the industry to develop this final number. The original resolution went out for business impact review on May 2nd, 2019, and the fee was $2,285 per application. As you can imagine, we received quite a few comments on this through the business impact solicitation process, and so we held an industry workshop on July 15th, 2019. Based upon the feedback received from the industry, Regarding the $2,285 fee, the staff went back, sharpened their pencils, and came back with the proposed number, which is $1,372 per attachment. The FCC regulations permit the city to charge the approximate actual cost of services rendered. Staff believes we are suggesting such a number today, and Mr. McCosker is here to detail those costs for you. Good morning, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Happy holidays. For the record, Kevin McCosker with the City of Las Vegas Department of Building and Safety. So we issue and building and safety permits for telecommunication devices on city-owned property. An applicant typically makes an application for these small wireless devices that we screen for completeness, create an application, route plans for review, and collect fees for services. The building division, or, I'm sorry, the land, de land development division of the Building and Safety Department reviews and comments on the plans to ensure compliance with the adopted standards, and in the case of small cell sites, we also route it to public works, traffic engineering, and field operations for review. Upon approval by Building and Safety and Public Works, we issue a permit to perform the construction work. Building and Safety provides um, inspection services on the utility conduit, bedding, backfill at the first inspection, the second inspection, we ensure the replacement of any asphalt, concrete curb and gutter, utility collars, utility collars, and asphalt replacement meets the required standards and performance requirements. Public Works TFO division coordinates the electrical services for the proposed work prior to permit, and then they provide plan review and inspections on the electrical facilities for the project. The final inspection by Building and Safety ensures that TFO is completed and all the work is done and there's no damage to the existing infrastructure. The resolution before you today is to establish a reasonable and fair actual estimated cost basis for these services rendered by the city teams performing coordination, plan review, permit issue, and inspection services for these devices. City team review the time necessary to provide said services and the fully burdened cost for each position that has a hand in the process. Building and safety fees are $403 for permitting, plan review, and inspections of the work performed in the right-of-way for this application, and Public Works' TFO division's fees are $969 for, court for the coordination, permitting, and inspections. The total cost for this application is $1,372 as proposed. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, Joseph Norby, uh, Assistant Transportation Manager for the City of Las Vegas and the Public Works Department. Um, echo just a, a few of the, the items that uh, Kevin had mentioned as well. Um, and ju maybe just draw attention to the Exhibit 3 that's attached with the, uh, with the item this morning, uh, which details out TIFO's related and associated costs with small cell site development. Um, as TIFO is the department or the, the section within Public Works that manages, operates, and maintains traffic signal poles, street light poles, service meter, meter pedestals within the right of way, uh, what is detailed in Exhibit 3 outlines our estimated costs and time 
to do both pre and post construction investigations, inspections, uh, and uh, completion for the deployment of small cell sites. Thank you. We're here. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bertin. We're here to answer any questions you have, though. Thank you so much. Does the council have any questions? Seeing none, Councilwoman Seaman may I have a motion, please. I move to approve. Please vote and post. And that motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for all your hard work. Now to agenda item 54, boards and commissions. Discussion for possible action regarding the appointment of nominee Wesley Harper as a Ward 5 member of the Community Development Recommending Board. The Office of Community Services recommends the aforementioned appointment. Councilman Creer, um, would you motion for this? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to make a motion for approval. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor. Please vote. Please post. And that motion carries. Agenda item number 55, discussion for possible action regarding the reappointment of Kevin McCoster to the Building and Safety Enterprise Fund Advisory Committee. Mr. McCoster fills the seat reserved for a public official who oversees the Enterprise Fund and does the Building and Safety Director. Mr. McCoster, reappointment is appropriate. And uh, that will be my motion to approve. Let's post. And that motion passes. Agenda item number 57, recommending committee bills, bills eligible for adoption at this meeting. Bill number 2019-45. Um, Councilman Anthony, would you like to have the bills read? Yes. Bill number 2019-45, an ordinance to amend LVMC chapter 6.50 to provide an exception to certain work card requirements for convenience stores that sell alcoholic beverages, clarify work card requirements for persons providing security in certain alcoholic beverage establishments, and provide for other related matters. Move for approval. There's a motion. Please post. That motion carries. Now to agenda item 58, bill number 2019-46. Councilman Anthony, would you like the bill read? Yes. Bill number 2019-46, First Amendment, an ordinance to amend the minimum special use permit requirements applicable to marijuana dispensaries as found in LVMC section 19.12.70 to require a 1,000 foot minimum distance separation between marijuana dispensaries, incorporate distance separation requirements between marijuana dispensaries and non-restricted gaming establishments as found in state law, and provide for other related matters. Move for approval of the First Amendment. Please vote and post. You got to vote this way. And that motion passes. Thank you. Now to agenda item number 60, recommending committee bills eligible for adoption at a later meeting. Item number 60, bill 2019-49 will be heard at a later meeting. We will move on to our new bills. Agenda item 61. Items number 61 through uh, 62, bill numbers 2019-50 through 2019-52 will be heard at the recommending committee meeting on Monday, January 13th, 2020. City Attorney, would you read the new bills? Yes, ma'am. Bill number 2019-50, an ordinance amending LVMC chapter 6.60 to update the process and standards for making available additional pawnbroker licenses based on population increase, including the authorization to conduct auctions related to the availability of new licenses and providing for other related matters. Bill number 2019-51, an ordinance to amend the Unified Development Code, specifically LVMC section 19.16.10, to add new provisions regarding neighborhood meetings, including mandatory meetings for certain types of applications, such as general plan amendments regarding land use and applications to repurpose certain golf courses and open spaces and to provide for other related matters. Thank you. New bills 2019-50 through 2019-52 are assigned to the January 13, 2020 recommending committee members which are Councilman Anthony and Knutson and myself. If any so designated are unavailable to attend, the clerk's office will coordinate finding substitutes as necessary at the mayor's direction. Thank you. So now we are going to go into our 10 a.m. session. 
Agenda item number 64. For possible actions for, uh, do we need to change anything, Claire? No, perfect. For possible action, any items uh, from the 10 a.m. session that the council staff and or applicant wish to be stricken, tabled, withdrawn, or held in abeyance to a future meeting may be brought forward and acted upon at this time. Councilwoman Seaman. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, the following items have been requested to be held in abeyance, withdrawn, tabled, or stricken. Session 10 a.m. discussion, items 70 and 71, SUP 77365 and SDR 77366, applicant owner 900 Fremont LLC at 916 Fremont Street, Request for abeyance till the January 15, 2020 meeting requested by Councilwoman Diaz. And item number 79, RQR-77463, applicant, Las Vegas Billboards, owner, Wild Decatur LLC, at 1571 North Decatur Boulevard. Request for abeyance to the January 15, 2020 meeting requested by staff. And that will be my motion. Thank you. Let's vote on, let's vote and post. And that motion carries. Items number 65 through 69 may be considered in one motion, one vote, and are considered routine, non-public, and public hearing items with no condition changes. Any person representing an application or a member of the public or member of the council not in agreement with the conditions and all standard conditions for the application recommended by staff should request to have that item removed from this portion of the agenda. Item number 65, RQR 77432, applicant Lamar Central Outdoor LLC, owner, SG Properties LLC on a required review of, a, of an approved special use permit U-0002-98 for a 55 foot tall, 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign at 845 West Bonanza Road, Industrial Zone, Ward 5, Creer. RQR 7745, applicant Clear Channel Outdoor Inc. Owner Willick Investments Inc on a required review of an approved special use permit U-0176-90 for a 40 foot tall, 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign at 3591 East Bonanza Road, C1 Limited Commercial Zone, Ward 3, Councilwoman Diaz, RQR 77437, applicant Clear Channel Outdoor Inc, owner Bell Real Estate, LLC on a required review of an approved special use permit U-0103-95 for a 40 foot tall, 12 foot by 24 foot off premise sign at 1910 Industrial Road, M Industrial Zone, Ward 3, Councilwoman Diaz, RQR-77464, applicant Lamar Central Outdoor LLC, owner FCPT Restaurant Properties LLC on a required review of an approved special use U-0185-89, which allowed a 40-foot tall, 14-foot by 48-foot off-premise sign at 1361 South Decatur Boulevard, C1 Limited Commercial Zone, Ward Councilman Knutson, 69, RQR-77486, Applicant Clear Channel Outdoor, Inc., Owner Becky Binion Binion, on a required <coughs> review of an approved variance, V-0072-88, which allowed an existing 50-foot tall, 12-foot by 24-foot off-premise sign at 601 North Main Street, M Industrial Zone, Ward 5, Councilman Creer. Staff recommends approval on all items. These are all public hearings, which I now declare open. I'll ask the city clerk uh, to set the timer at a minute uh, per speaker for this and public hearing items this afternoon. Is there anyone wishing to be heard on items 65 through 69? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Councilwoman Seaman, may I have a motion for one motion, one vote, items 65 through 69? Madam Mayor Portem? Yes. Before you uh, turn this over to Councilwoman De um, Seaman, I just want to make a disclaimer um, that I'm an owner of an outdoor billboard company called Career Outdoor Advertising. These are a number of uh, outdoor companies, we do not compete with them in any of these, and uh, there should not be 
there's no conflict of interest that I have and I'll be voting on these. Thank you, Councilman Thank you. Creer. Councilwoman Seaman. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I move to approve one motion, one vote, items 65 through 69. Thank you, please vote and post. Now we are on to agenda item 72. So 70 and 71 uh, was a beta stricken, so we're on 72. Okay. <laughs> I heard Councilman Career down there helping me out here. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, so um, let me just be clear on items 70 through, through 77. Per planning, Mr. Summerfield? Yes, ma'am, Mayor Pro Tem. Is there an unresolved 10 alleyway between this okay. development and I'm the sorry, adjacent Mayor properties? Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem? If, if I could, uh, since we're going to have a discussion, could you read the items in yes, first before absolutely. we? Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Scott. Okay. Um, item 72, GPA-77367, on a request for a general plan amendment from PCD, Plan Community Development, and PF, uh, Public Facilities, to M, Medium Density Residential. 73 is Zone-77572 on a request for a rezoning from U undevelop Undeveloped, PCD, Planned Community Developed, and PF, Public Facilities, General Plan Designations to R-TH, which is Single Family Attached. 74 is the uh, VAR-77701 on a request for a variance to allow non-standard private streets which where such is required, substreets where a cul-de-sac or hammerhead is required, and a connectivity ratio of 1.03 where 1.30 is required. 75, VIR 77573 on a request for a variance to allow a 12-foot tall retaining wall with a 6-foot tall perimeter wall, where a 4-foot tall retaining wall and a 6 to 8-foot tall perimeter wall is the maximum allowed. 76 is VAC-77574 on a request for a petition to vacate U.S. government patent easements. 77 is the TMP-77575 on a request for a tentative map for a 336 lot single family attached residential subdivision townhome. The applicant is Harmony Homes Nevada LLC and the owner is United States of America on 30 acres at the northeast corner of Tropical Parkway and Pooley Road. U, Undeveloped Zone, PCD, Planned Community Development, and PF, Public Facilities, General Plan Designations, proposed R, TH, Single Family Attached. The Planning Commission recommends approval on all of the items. Staff recommends on approval on items 72, 73, and 76, and denial on items number 74, 75, and 77. These are in Ward 6, my ward, and our public hearings, which um, I'm going to declare open now. Um, is the applicant present? Good morning. Yes, Good morning. the applicant is Larry Bitten with Horrocks Engineers uh, representing Harmony Homes. Okay. Mr. Summerfield? Madam Mayor Pro Tem. My, my question on this, because I know that we had, um, I believe, in planning, we obeyed KB Homes because there was a 10-foot alley. Is there a 10-foot alley with this project? So, Madam Mayor, for Tim, so one of the um, one of the issues that was that is still of concern, although the applicant's ability to do anything with it are are not um, are pretty minimal. On the eastern edge of this property, there is a 10-foot drainage easement which uh, will create, for lack of a, a nicer term, a no man's land, um, because that easement is outside the perimeter wall of the existing apartment complex. So on the 
image that you see, we have an existing, um, uh, an existing apartment complex. Outside of their wall, there's a 10-foot drainage easement. The, the property owner, the developer, when they come in and they put in their perimeter wall, it will create a 10-foot gap between the new perimeter wall from the Harmony Homes project to the perimeter wall of the existing apartment complex. And how many feet, 10 feet by what? Um, it's 10 foot and I believe it runs the length of the apartment complex. So it would be the, the full length of that eastern border, a northeastern border of the subject property as you can see on the screen in front of you. So it's going to be literally right between uh, the new development and the apartments? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so. Can I, can I add some clarifying information? Absolutely. Sure, we've met with staff in regards to that drainage easement and our understanding is it's a private drainage easement owned by the adjacent site, mm -hmm. or public drainage easement for public waters but privately maintained. And the advantage, uh, what we're doing is we're we're shielding that drainage that is currently feeding that drainage easement. Uh, now, after working with staff, we will be directing flows around our site to where we're no longer uh, putting flows into, into that easement. And also along that west, west boundary of the site, there isn't a perimeter wall. It's, a, it's just an open drainage easement. It goes into a small U-ditch, which is, uh, from, our, from our records, show that that is on the apartment site's property. So it's, it's a public drainage easement on their property, privately maintained. So Mr. Summerfield, can you just clarify, was, was this obeyed at planning on December 10th? Uh, stand by one second, I'll need to pull that up. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, so this item went to Planning Commission actually on November 12th, and it was uh, passed unanimously. The Planning Commission had held it in abeyance. It looks like the general plan amendment to allow these other applications to catch up had been abated at the October 22nd Planning Commission. Okay. But once the entire package was present at the November 12th meeting, um, I'm not showing that there was any additional abeyance at that time. Okay. So, sir, um, I, I would really like for you to come in, in my office and figure out, the thing that scares me with alleyways, and because we have another project, is um, creating uh, an area for a homeless encampment. Um, Mr. Summerfield, have we had any issues right now in that area before building, uh, before this goes forth? Madam Mayor, uh, so as you saw in the one picture, there, there's clearly there's been signs that there's been some illegal dumping. I think there was a mattress there present on the site on the day that we went and took our site pictures. However, we do not have any, um, any records of any encampment activity occurring at this western edge of the city in, in this vacant area. Okay. Um. So have you been in my office talking? We have, yes. Okay. Yes, and the so, and we, we the developer, and so we've met twice in your office. Right, and so I thought we did, but I don't recall talking about this alleyway. You know what? Th we haven't because the issue hasn't been raised until I've just heard it now. And because we, in working with staff, that easement is on the adjacent property site right. and their responsibility. And again, uh, you're concerned about homeless. There isn't a wall in between the property line and the adjacent development, so, it, so it's open. There's not, a, there's not a place for people to gather and be hidden. All there is, there's about a, a two foot high, essentially a concrete curb that captures water coming from the west and diverts it around or with through the apartment site. There's storm drains that go through. So it's not a hidden area and it's not behind a wall. But we're, we're happy to work yeah. through staff. We, we can. So, uh, I, so one of the things I have to tell you, I'm, I'm very concerned creating any alleyways 
we've had an issue in, in a previous development that was built and then DR Horton was building next to it and so we had to really figure out and now we have a, another issue to where there's another 10 foot alleyway and going forth in the northwest I just don't want all these alleyways um, created so we have to come up with a conclusion of not letting that happen so if you would be um, understandably I would like to obey these items until our next council meeting and have Yes. Um, yes. Before you do that. Nope. Councilman Creer? Just that's why I'm at we haven't had public comment. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right, no worries. So um, so before I do that, I just wanna before I open it to public comment, I just wanna make sure um, that you are okay with coming and having I just want before I approve anything, mm -hmm. I really need to make sure that our Northwest community um, is safe and everything's going to go as planned because alleyways sometimes could be very dangerous. Un understood. Understood. Okay. So I, I just think if we, if if we had photos of that area, it'd be very clear that it's that it's not an alleyway. There, there's not a separate area. Okay. Mr. Summerfield? So, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, so as he said, so it looks like there is some type of, and I apologize, I, my notes say that it's a wall, but it looks like maybe in the aerial photos that I'm looking at that maybe it is some kind of um, maybe low rise fence or something there. Uh, as the applicant's representative has mentioned, it is not an alley, it is drainage, it is a drainage channel. Um, however, I was just speaking with uh, representation from Public Works, Mr. Anderson, and if, as the applicant has indicated, that their drainage study and their drainage plan for the site, and, and we'll need to look at it to make sure, but if they are, in fact, the drainage will no longer go to this drainage easement, then there may be an opportunity for the property owner, and as the representative mentioned, the drainage easement is on the private property of the existing apartment complex, not on the Harmony uh, home site. Um, but there may be an opportunity if the drainage is, easement is no longer required because of the work they're doing on their site, then it may be an option to talk to the apartment complex ownership and uh, vacate that um, that easement and then them reclaim that property and be able to um, secure it in a different way than it's currently secured. So that may be an option based on um, if in fact the drainage is no longer gonna be using that channel um, from flows from the applicant site. But again, that property is completely under the um, authority and care of that property owner, right. which is the apartment complex. And that's the, and, and I have to tell you, I can't speak for them. I can't speak for the owner of the property right. if they're going to be willing to. And what I want to make sure we don't do is is create an alley. So like on that back wall mm -hmm. where we're looking at that, I wouldn't want a block wall. So what 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 might be acceptable is if we had like a three foot retainer wall and then wrought iron. So this way there you can see through that and no one is going to create dumping or or hanging out in in that alley i mean would you i want to move this forward but at the same time i don't want the 10-foot alley to become an issue sure we perhaps we could have a condition where where the developer would work with the adjacent property owner to remove the existing alley or the the existing concrete gutter and um not I don't know how we'd word it, but not create an enclosed or, a, or a, a site with limited visibility in there. Because, I mean, we can't control what happens on the adjacent property. Right. Yeah. And, but we're happy to work with them and, and we'll develop up to our property line and work with them on, on eliminating any unsafe or unsatisfactory condition along the property line. Okay, so um, Mr. Summerfield, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Can we create an amendment on that? So I'm looking to see where we would put this because this is a tentative map instead of a site development review. We typically do not have conditions related to the fencing, but if you'll give me, indulge me just a second so that I can pull up the map itself. 
um, and see if they've, because uh, they should have cross sections that show the um, Something down here. the walls. So I just want to see what they have on the that side. So just so you know, something underneath my desk is making a really weird noise. I hope I don't blow up. Okay. Yeah, it's under yours. Yeah, it's me. I, I do have the tentative map. <laughs> um, just hang on. Someone has to go under my desk. Thank you. Mr. Summerfield? Madam Mayor uh, Pro Tem, so, so I'm looking at, and, and it just conferred with the, the applicant's engineer, so in the area that we're talking about, because of the grade change, they actually have a retaining portion of their wall that actually will be about anywhere from along this area, they're indicating anywhere from a zero to a 12 foot retaining wall and then with a proposed six foot uh, wall um, above that. They are indicating on their plans that it is a view fence, so it is not uh, proposed on the drawing currently as a masonry wall. Um, so they are indicating a view fence, which I'm assuming mm -hmm. is slatted so you can see through. That's why they're Correct. calling it a view Correct. fence. A, a, a so, um, so I think that achieves what you want, which is eyes to be on the drainage channel from the new uh, property owners. However, just to be clear, based on what you originally had asked for, because of the grade changes, they will not be able to achieve that smaller retaining. They have potentially a pretty um, large retaining wall that they'll need to to do on there. As far as a condition that, as the applicant had addressed, I think that can be a condition on the record in terms of he's made that commitment to you here mm -hmm. on the record. I, unfortunately, I do not have a place in the conditions of approval to place a condition like that, but staff would be happy to continue to work with your office, with the applicant, and with the neighboring property to figure out if there is the ability for them to reclaim that easement and possibly do a vacation in the future so that the apartment complex can maybe reclaim where that drainage easement is now and, and make that more usable for their residents even based on uh, the changes to drainage that will be occurring on the subject site. Okay, well thank you. So just so you know, I, I love Harmony Homes and, and you guys really put out a great product. So I'm not going to delay it or obey it. Um, I'm going to, before I make my motions on this, um, is there anyone uh, wishing to be heard on these items? Okay. So, Madam Mayor. Excuse me. There, there was one revised condition. Yes. Oh, yes. there we go. So that's, yeah. So before we do get to a motion, um, Mr. Anderson from Public Works does need to read in an amended condition change for number 14 on the tentative map, which is item number 77 this morning. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem, Bart Anderson, Las Vegas Public Works. Um, I'd like to amend, as, as Robert says, condition number 14 to read as follows. If not built by others prior to permits, construct an oversized public sewer along the full frontage of this site in Tropical Parkway to the intersection of Pooley Road or other location acceptable to the city engineer. Contact the Sanitary Sewer Planning Section of the Department of Public Works to enter into an oversizing agreement prior to construction to be reimbursed for the cost difference of constructing an oversized sewer versus an 8-inch sewer. 
The developer shall provide to the city all information and materials necessary to submit an application to amend Bureau of Land Management right-of-way grants N-55999, N-90154, and any others that may be applicable to ensure appropriate rights for construction and maintenance of public sewer are in place. That's the condition that I'd like to amend, and the reason for that is that when this site was uh, sold by the BLM, the adjoining site was not sold. And while we had um, conditioned the BLM sale of that site to provide these easements, since it wasn't sold, they weren't provided, and we're now asking that they be provided and that this applicant who needs them help us get them. Thank you. So do you agree to everything? Correct. We okay. concur with all staff's recommendations. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And the newest one where we're going to be working together to make sure we don't create an alley? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so again, I'm just going to say, um, are there, is there anyone else in the audience wishing to be heard on these items, 72 through 77? Okay, thank you. On item number 72, my motion is to approve with all conditions, and I'll be voting aye. Please vote and please post. That motion carries. On item number 73, my motion is to approve with all conditions. My motion is aye. Councilman Career? Aye. He's an aye on 72 as well and 73. Motion posted, motion passes. On my item 74, my motion is to approve with all conditions. Please vote aye and post. Thank you, that motion passes. On item, agenda item number 75, my motion is to approve with all conditions. Thank you, vote and post, that motion passes. On item number 76, my motion is to approve with all conditions. <coughs> Please vote, aye, and post. Thank you, that motion passes. And finally, on item number 77, my motion is to approve with all conditions. I vote aye. As amended. Vote. As amended. Yes, that's what I meant when I said all conditions. And amended. And please post. And that motion carries. Thank you so much. And let's uh, get back together in my office and make sure that we just don't create an alibi. Do. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, we are going to agenda item number 80. Yes. Oh, yes. Hang on, this guy's going under my desk again. Okay, we are back. We are on agenda item number 78, zone 77502, public hearing, applicant owners, Stephen A. Phillips and Raynell Phillips for possible action on a request for zoning from you undeveloped to MXU, mixed use, general plan designation to C1, limited commercial on 5.52 acres at 6651 West Charleston Boulevard, Ward 1, Councilman Knutson, the Planning Commission and staff recommend approval. This is a public hearing. I now declare it open. Is the applicant present? Good morning, Council. Steve Phillips, 4890 Von Liedner Street. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Summerfield. <laughs> Madam Mayor, the pro uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, the proposed zoning uh, of the subject site is compatible with those surrounding land uses and zoning districts, and its staff has recommended approval. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion, Councilman Knudsen? Mayor Pro Tem, I've driven this site multiple times and I've purchased my Christmas tree from this lot <laughs> um, for the last 10 years. I'm very sad to see the Christmas tree business uh, not be there anymore. Um, but the proposed zoning change is appropriate for that area and I am in support and would motion for approval. Thank you so much. There's a motion on the floor. I vote aye. Let's vote and post. And that motion carries. Great. Good luck. Thank you. And Thank I you. paid for four hours of parking. Any chance I can get a refund? <laughs> Merry, yes, Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Thanks Thank for you the very donation. Much. <laughs> you can get a sticker at the, if you parked in the structure, you can get a sticker at security. You can get a sticker at security if you parked in the structure. If you parked in the structure. Thank you. You're welcome. Agenda item number 80. Uh, DIR-77619, applicant owner, City of Las Vegas, for possible action on a request to approve the 2020 Planning Commission meeting schedule. The Planning Commission recommends denial, staff recommends approval. This is a public hearing. I now declare it open. Mr. Summerfield? Madam Mayor Pro Tem, um, before you this afternoon, this morning, is the uh, 2020 schedule for the Planning Commission. Uh, when this went to the Planning Commission, we um, proposed a schedule that was consistent with council direction from um, last year, this time last year, which was to continue a two meeting a month Planning Commission cycle. Um, the Planning Commission um, chose not to approve that schedule and ask for direction from City Council. Um, based on conversations at briefings yesterday, I, the clerk's office is passing out right now um, two options that we have for an agenda. The first option is to maintain the two meeting a month Planning Commission schedule, um, which is the version that was in the backup material as well. Um, the second option is if the council, based on our current um, uh, trending numbers um, and the average length of the planning commissions, is supportive of going to one meeting a month, then we have that schedule as well. One meeting a month would start in February, and we would uh, have those planning commission meetings occur on the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, beginning in February. We do have two meetings currently scheduled for January as January actually falls on the preceding year's calendar. With that, I'll take any questions and uh, again, staff supports whatever uh, direction the council chooses to take on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Summerfield. Is there anyone wishing to be heard on this item? Yes, excuse me, um, I just would like to address the council. I need you to state your name, <coughs> sir, and your address. My name is Admin Glaster. Are you uh, making a comment on this particular item? Um, I, I, was I was coming to address the council to be clear on what item, um, the initiative for uh, the homeless. No, this is not that item, sir. Um, this is about our planning commission. So, so, it's so what, if we get to that, I she's going to talk to our clerk. This is not the item. OK. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, ma'am. And thanks for coming oh. down here with those crutches and being part of City Council and, and all of that. So all if right. you talk to Miss Stacy, she'll help you. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, sir. Okay, so this is a public hearing and I declare it open. Is there anyone uh, wishing to be heard on this? So you know what I would like to do for the record? Um, Mr. Summerfield and our fabulous city manager, Scott Adams, um, on this particular agenda, and I would like to get feedback from my council members before I make a motion for this, um, for agenda item number 80. Um, so we worked really hard on making sure we had two meetings a month to make sure, that, because it's all about the customer in the city of Las Vegas. It's all about the customer. Um, and what we were finding previously is we had meetings that lasted here until 4.40 a.m. We had a planning commissioner fall asleep on the way home driving. It was not um, acceptable, but at the rate, and at the same time, so at the rate that we are now, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Summerfield, um, right now the Planning Commission meetings are going for about an hour, an hour and a half, correct? Yes, ma'am. Our, our average meeting is about 90 minutes, so it's okay. about an hour and a half. We've had one meeting um, since, since short-term rentals were no longer a part of our agendas. 
We've had one meeting that went for a total of five hours, but most of our meetings are averaging at about 90 minutes. Okay, and so depending upon which way the council votes, because I, I don't know how everyone's going to vote on this, I just want to make sure, and Mr. Adams, if you want to say a few words on this, um, it is the most important that our customers never wait, you know, past 10 o'clock, and depending upon if we vote one meeting or two meetings, if we were to vote one meeting, I want to make sure that there is that option if we have to put a second meeting in, that that could be placed administratively, and it can happen without, I mean, how does that work? So, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, so if we go with the one meeting a month schedule, um, yes, so as we have usually pretty good lead time to know what an agenda volume is going to look like because of our pre-application process um, and those submittals. So if we find that we, we look like we're going to have an excessively long agenda, um, I have the ability to uh, contact the chair of the Planning Commission and request that they add a special meeting in which then we can divide up that agenda between those two meetings prior to them ever posting or, or publishing an agenda so that we could address that. Um, it is, as I mentioned in briefings yesterday, it is generally easier to add meetings to a, a schedule than it is to try to take meetings away if we find current trends continue the way they are and, and that's of con uh, concern or consideration for the council. Thank you, Mr. Summerfield. Mr. Adams, can I just have a couple of thoughts from you on this? Uh, sure, Scott Adams, city manager, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, as, as I mentioned in uh, briefing yesterday, previously I, I had a real concern about the way the Planning Commission was heading because um, anytime you go past midnight, you're really putting our customers in a situation that I, I don't believe is appropriate um, f for a customer, somebody who's appearing before the Planning Commission have to wait from 6 p.m. when the meeting starts to all the way through midnight and past. Uh, given the fact that we, um, we, we looks like we're averaging an hour and a half, I think we're going to be mitigating that issue. The, the only thing I mentioned in briefing is that when you look at the entitlement process, um, the, when you look at the entire development process from beginning to end when an applicant goes forward with a major project, entitlements are the, the long pole in the tent. They're the things that drive the length of the process. So the time that they appear before Planning Commission and Council is really determining the length of that time schedule. So taking away a meeting means you cause somebody to wait longer to get to Planning Commission. That's my only concern right now. Uh, balancing that, though, with the commitment that our volunteers make, our volunteer Planning Commissioners, to serve as Planning Commissioners, uh, I think it's a reasonable balance to go back to uh, one meeting a month with the understanding that we could add a meeting when necessary should volume warrant. My only concern has been is we've always had to come to the council to force that to happen. Um, they've never been willing to do it, um, so that, that'd be my only comment here is um, there ought to be some mechanism that says if the volume really starts to crank up and we really start pushing that midnight hour again that we somehow can quickly go to that second meeting without having to go through a lot of rigmarole, rigmarole like we have in the past. Thank you, Mr. Adams. And Mr. Summerfield, we have that mechanism in place right now, don't we? So Madam Mayor Pro Tem, so we have it for the one-off. So I can work, the chair can call a special meeting, mm -hmm. and it, it would be a special meeting. So if I advise, because we're seeing the numbers tick up for a particular meeting that we need to have a second meeting that month, um, we would have that ability to call a special meeting working with the chair. The schedule, though, the schedule does, an amendment to the schedule does require action of at least the Planning Commission to approve a revised schedule per their bylaws. And if they don't approve one, then it comes forward to City Council as we've done the last two years. So to, to the City Manager's point, um, I think it would have to be with an understanding that the Planning Commission knows that you all, and I think maybe you can even make that as part of your motion, that it is expected that should volumes um, creep up and that they 
show that they're going to trend and stay that way, the Planning Commission would amend their schedule to include a two meeting a month schedule um, at that time. Thank you, Mr. Summerfield. So again, before I make my motion, I'd like to open it up to council. Council members, does anyone have anything yeah, to I say? Do. Okay, we'll start down here. Thank Councilman you. Creer. Thank you, Madam Mayor Portem. Um, from a person that was on the Planning Commission for two years and sat through uh, meetings that lasted for us at the two o'clock, maybe three o'clock in the morning, uh, I am very, very, very and intimately sensitive to uh, how long these meetings last. And I do believe that, and I've said this in the past, I don't believe that we're at our best. I don't believe the city's at their best when you go past midnight, one o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. Okay. And so I was very happy when we moved to the two meetings because I thought it would be uh, much more better for, for everybody involved. Uh, but since the meetings have been averaging an uh, hour and a half, and um, I know that it's a lot and it's a commitment for the planning commissioners that we ask to serve as well on there, right? We have some very um, uh, professional people who are taking time out of their schedules twice a month to come out. If there is an opportunity to limit that to once a month, I think that would be better as well. Um, and so I would be in favor of moving it back to once a month. And if it becomes a problem and a nuisance, I think this council will address it and deal with it. And if we have to go back to two, two nights a month, then it is what it is. But at this point, I would definitely go back to one day, one day out of the month. Thank you. Councilman Anthony. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I see no reason why we should go back to uh, one meeting a month. Um, it's been two meetings a month for a while. And uh, I, I just look at it from the developer's perspective. Um, I think the developers want to know when these planning commission meetings are scheduled in advance, which they would be under this option where the dates are already set for the year. Uh, if you go to one meeting a month, um, I think you mentioned in our briefing yesterday, it's going to um, double the time for these, uh, 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 these developments to be approved. Uh, right, I think it was like 45 days to 100, 100 days or something like that, you said, Robert? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, so yes, Councilman. So right now, it's, it's about a 45-day period from submittal of application to get to the Planning Commission hearing. Um, what, this, what it would slow down is right now, those Planning Commission meetings happen approximately every two weeks occasionally if we have a fifth, um, fifth Tuesday in there, then it's, uh, it's a three-week. But that gives them more opportunity to be in the month of March. They know they have two meetings that they can shoot for. Um, the, the area where it really would interfere in terms of those time frames is, as I mentioned yesterday, if you have an applicant who has to do some minor tweak to their application in order to get it through and they need to obey, um, now they would be obeying instead of a potential, although we don't encourage it, a potential abeyance of two weeks, now they're obeying a full month and that adds another 30 days instead of 14 days um, potentially to their application window, um, right. which then trickles because now they're on an, another, if it requires city council action, then they're on another city council agenda a month from there. So. So yes, it, it has the potential for there to be delays in the process with uh, one meeting a month. Right, and I, I over think over what we have now. I think that's the whole point. I mean, what we're trying to do with the city is we're trying to be business friendly, development friendly. The economy's hot; people are doing stuff. Uh, we, we don't we don't need to prolong these developments. Uh, we meet twice a month. The planning sh commission should meet twice a month. Uh, it doesn't impact the budget going to twice a month. The schedule will be set now for the entire year um that's your that's your recommendation staff right and uh i'm going to support your recommendation thank you councilwoman diaz thank you madam mayor pro tem i've been reaching out to some folks that frequently come through my office with development projects and they feel that the workload that was on the shoulders of the Planning Commission um, has significantly um, been reduced um, and they've, they're comfortable with us going back to a monthly cycle. I see that our Planning Commissioners themselves want to go back to a monthly cycle and I think that when you keep everybody happy, that's the best element because they're gonna do the best job that they can and I like that if 
uh, Mr. Summerfield sees that the workload is increasing, uh, knocking on wood, 2020, we're gonna see lots of development happening in the city of Las Vegas, and we're gonna have to add a second meeting, then that's something that can be done, and I feel comfortable voting for a monthly meeting knowing that a second can be requested upon the volume increasing. So I think that's reasonable, I think it's fair, and most importantly, I think the planning commissioners, you know, I think it would make their life easier to know that they're focusing on one meeting versus being parted into, but I know they will be flexible and work with us if a second is required. Thank you, Councilwoman Diaz and Councilman Knudsen. Thank you very much, very much, uh, Mary Pro Tem. So I, I echo the concerns by Councilman Anthony. Um, however, um, along with Councilwoman Diaz, and what I, I, I think you m mentioned is the, the one meeting a month I'm comfortable with as long as there's relief valves. Um, so if our planning director, Mr. Summerfield, can acknowledge that um, if there is an abundance of items that calling a special meeting is appropriate, um, I would also like the opportunity if, as a council, if, if or a council member, if I'm getting requests um, that it's delaying the development process, then I would like to be able to talk about that. Maybe we can do that in council meetings to say there's a, there's a hold up and potentially call for a special planning commission meeting. Um, so with that, I, I'm comfortable with one meeting a month as long as there's release valves to change if we need to. Thank you, Councilman Knudsen and Councilwoman Seaman. Yeah, I have the same concerns as the city manager and Councilman Anthony uh, regarding entitlements and the long haul time before the next meeting, and again, as Mayor Pro Tem said, this is about customer service, so I'm going to support staying at the two meetings per month. Okay. Thank you, and so thank you, council members, um, for weighing in. So with that, I'm going to make my motion. Um, know that the chair of planning commission is my chair, was my planning commissioner, Lou DeSalvio, who has been texting me crazily while we're up here, telling me that he will obey. <laughs> if we need two meetings, he will make that happen. So, and I, and I know, and as um, my peers up here, so I'm going to make the motion uh, with the exception, so to go back to the monthly meeting, however, Mr. Summerfield, um, as you see things coming up, you get with our planning chair, Mr. Del Salvio, and get that second meeting on so our customers don't wait. Because if we see a, a, a problem with that, then I'm, I'm very I'm back in favor of going back to two meetings a month. But for right now, my motion will be to go, you want to restate how we're going to say that? So Madam Mayor Pro Tem, if I could, then what I would ask is that um, before you, you have a one meeting a month option. So if your motion could be to adopt the one meeting a month option of the 2020 Planning Commission meeting schedule, that would be, I believe, appropriate. I'll look at our city attorney's office. And then I will um, confirm for you that we will do that. And then for Councilman Knudsen's request, we will make available on a monthly basis um, a kind of a recap so that you can see what the, the trend is looking like so that if you want to have a further discussion in the new year or as uh, a couple months of one meeting a month get under our belt, if you have any concerns, we can revisit the conversation at least and uh, go from there. Perfect. Thank you. So that is my motion. Please vote. and post, and that motion carries. Thank you so much. And now we will go to reports and presentations, agenda item number 81. And we have a report from our fabulous city manager, Scott D. Adams. Mr. Good morning, um, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the city council, Scott Adams, city manager. I have just one quick report to make. Uh, something I mentioned to you in briefing yesterday, and that is this past week, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to take up for consideration the appeal of the Ninth Circuit Court's decision in the Boise case, that being the Boise case relative to homeless encampments. And I want to remind uh, our city council and the public that our encampment ordinance that you passed contemplated the Boise decision, in fact, accommodates uh, the concerns that were expressed by the Ninth Circuit Court in that decision. Uh, one notable um, consideration was the fact that 
as we implement or move forward with the encampment ordinance, that we can suspend enforcement should there not be sufficient shelter capacity at the time we're we're implementing the or administering the or, the ordinance. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Um, I didn't want anyone to think that the fact that they didn't take it up meant that it had some tremendously negative impact on what we're doing with our encampment ordinance. It's business as usual because we put that in place with the Boise Ninth Circuit Court decision in place. Um, so it'll be business as usual going forward under the timeline that we had previously indicated in terms of uh, the administration and enforcement of the encampment ordinance. That, that is the end of my report. Thank you so much, Mr. Adams. This is a report only and no motion is required. We're going to move on to item number 82, which is a report by Jonathan Ullman, Chairman of Downtown Vegas Alliance, DVA, regarding the organization's activities and achievements throughout 2019 and their goals for 2020. All wards. Mr. Arndt, Mr. Ullman, or we don't have Mr. Ullman. <laughs> Would you state your name for the record, both of you? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor Pro Tem and members of City Council. For the record, Bill Arndt, Economic and Urban Development. With me today is Carolyn Wheeler, who is the Executive Director of the Downtown Vegas Alliance. Uh, Ms. Wheeler has a great presentation to talk to you about what's happened over this past calendar year and what we can look forward to on the year ahead. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carolyn. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to share with you some really exciting things that we've done for the Alliance and with the city last year and some of the great things that we're going to be doing this year. Um, as you know, the Downtown Vegas Alliance is an organization of 70 plus members consisting of large and small business owners as well as nonprofit partners. All of our members have a shared commitment to our mission, which is to create a vibrant and diverse and sustainable downtown. We've done this by putting together a series of successful meetings and convenings for our members and for the public to help them understand issues that relate to the downtown and to engage with partners like the city and other community agencies. Um, in addition to our su Success as an Insight event, where we bring in 250 people to learn about different topics that are relating to downtown, we also have a series of mixers and meetings with the city where our members are able to provide input and ask questions. We're really excited for uh, 2020 and are glad to be partnering with the city again this year. Um, we've really set some great goals for the Downtown Vegas Alliance. We are looking forward to increasing the attendance at the events that we're gonna be doing and generating more media coverage for them. We're also gonna continue to present relative uh, timely uh, topics that relate to our businesses and our residents, and really capitalize on utilizing subject matter experts that we have in the city, in our membership, and in surrounding communities. We're also gonna have a little bit of fun and incorporate some more social media interaction, really generate some buzz, and engage people and people in our audience and our members around our events. We're also gonna be continuing to work with the city and provide feedback on some of the initiatives and the meetings that we're doing. And we're also really gonna understand how the Downtown Vegas Alliance can not only address issues, but be part of the solution that is affecting our community. And one of the things that is very important to us is as we do these events, as we do these meetings, as we do these initiatives, that we're gonna be creating clear and actionable next steps for our members. So just to give you a preview of some of the events that we have planned for 2020, um, we are gonna continue with our successes and insights in February. Um, based on the mayor's schedule, we would love to have another meeting with our steering committee and the mayor. Uh, we'll also be doing a successes and insights in partnership with Living in the City in the spring. We'll continue to do another successes and insights in October. And then again, more meetings with our city council members and our members. 
Um, and then I hope to be here again next year in December and presenting all the amazing things we've done for 2020. So as we uh, plan out our dates, we'll make sure that all of you are invited to the meetings and really get a chance to meet our members and hear more about what the Downtown Vegas Alliance is doing. So thank you guys so much for your time and your support. We really appreciate your partnership. Thank you so much. Um, this is a report only and no motion is required. Uh, Mr. Arndt, do you have anything to add? No, I just on behalf of the City of Las Vegas, I'd like to thank Ms. Wheeler and the entire Downtown Vegas Alliance. Uh, I believe that private business best represents private business and that's really the spirit of our partnership to have our, our private businesses and industry that are doing such wonderful things in downtown be represented by a stakeholder group to help move downtown forward. So thank, thank you, you for I hearing agree. our report. Yes, well thanks for that report, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. We will now move on to item number 83, which we are going to have a presentation by city staff on development trends and on the process improvements in the city's development functions, including the ongoing electronic development department integration. Project EDDI, a multi-year program to update the functions and system for all departments at the Development Service Center, DCS, and all wards. Mr. Adams, oh, Mr. Perigo. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. And uh, I'm really happy to say good morning. Uh, Tom Perigo, Executive Director of Community Development. We're going to give you a uh, kind of a very brief overview of some of the development trends uh, that we're seeing through the Development Services Center. And then uh, uh, Rick Vermani is going to give you an update on Project Eddy uh, and the things that we're doing in order to uh, better serve our customers. So um, just to kind of give you a sense from the different departments, Public Works, uh, these are uh, transportation corridor assets that were developed as part of development projects over the last five years. 72 miles of public sewer, that's a significant uh, number. That also means that 72 miles of roadways were developed within private development in order to um, accommodate the new growth in our community. Um, and you can see some of the other numbers here in terms of storm drain, traffic signals, school flasher systems, pedestrian flasher systems, and 750 street lights. All of this to uh, accommodate and go in with uh, new development. Uh, you can see here the pri uh, public sector uh, roadway projects, about 30 miles developed over the last five years. Uh, so remember though, that's just the, the public. Uh, we just talked about the private side, so um, it's well over 70 miles of roadways that have been developed. Barricade plans process is a huge indicator of development activity, and you can see that it's been steadily increasing um, over the last five years. So then we look at uh, the planning department and, and entitlements that have come through as an indicator of growth. Um, you can see 2,400 projects in the last five years. That's all the, the activity that the planning department processes um, for planning commission and for ultimately city council decisions. 7,800 acres absorbed in that time. That's a significant uh, amount of development. 9,600 single family, 7,500 multifamily. So you can see a, a significant amount of multifamily development. We know we have a shortage of uh, multifamily uh, apartments, condos, and so on, and we're seeing a, a tremendous amount of activity in developing multifamily units. And uh, almost 10 million square feet of commercial uh, industrial space entitled during that time frame. Uh, license applications have remained steady, but uh, a significant uh, number, uh, around 10,000 business applications um, annually that are processed. And then building and safety. This is where it goes from, we make public investment and then we have um, entitlements and then we have development. So you can see 22,000 uh, building permits um, issued this year. Uh, it's interesting that we're seeing that same trend in multifamily through those permits and single family um, and significant amount of commercial as well. Here's the valuation, uh, $1.5 billion in 2019. That's a pretty big number. What's driving that big increase from around seven, eight hundred million annually we've seen over the last four or five years, that's all the downtown activity. So we've seen a significant increase in building permit activity. That will then translate into um, assessed value and, and, and everything that goes with that and all that activity in our downtown. So we will see that, we see that activity in wards uh, three and five um, and all that downtown development. Number of inspections, just to give you an idea, 100,000 uh, this year. 
um, and about 90 to 100,000 over the last five years, every single year. That's your building and safety inspectors out in the field taking care of, of our customers. I always like to uh, kind of wrap up looking at uh, assess value. And uh, in my opinion, assess value is one of the um, truest measures of our success as a city. I think that uh, what we do as a city to um, make sure that we have quality development projects, that we have safe neighborhoods, that we have uh, excellent parks, recreation, all the services we provide, public safety, that all wraps up into creating demand for our city. People want to live here. They want to raise their families here. They want to do business here. They want to open their business here. They want to be part of this great city of Las Vegas. And that's reflected in demand for uh, property, and that then is uh, translated into assessed value, which ultimately brings property taxes and revenue that we need to continue to provide the great services. So what we see here is across all the wards, I had them break it down by ward, we've seen uh, a fairly healthy growth in assessed value over the last five years. And you can see the numbers bouncing around between four and, and 8% and, some, and sometimes uh, 2018 uh, hovering around 10% change uh, in assessed value in our city. And I think, again, that's a reflection of all the work we do at the city and all the things that we're doing to create a great uh, quality of life for people. And then you can kind of see that, that trend uh, over time for the entire city. So again, hovering around 5 6%. Uh, 2018, 11% was a big number. 2020 is going to be another big year when all of the projects that that permit valuation that I showed, how there was a big uptick in 2019, that will translate into assessed value in 2020. So that's just sort of a real high level overview of some of the development activity. Um, it's, it's really interesting when you step back and take a look at it, there's a lot of work being done at the Development Services Center in our city and all of the people that are working hard every day to make sure that we're serving your customers and building great projects in your wards. And uh, really uh, exciting and really proud to be a part of that. Now I'm going to turn it over to Rick who's going to give you an update on some of the things we're doing to improve our processes and the way we serve our customers, focusing on Project Eddy. Rick is a, is a great guy to be leading this effort. He's not just an IT guy, but he's a process uh, engineer uh, mind, and he's really good at helping figure out how to really streamline our processes at the same time, provide the um, uh, techno technological tools to help uh, facilitate those processes and, again, better serve our customers. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rick. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Madam Mayor, Pro Tem, uh, City Council, I'm here. My name is Rick Vermani. I am the Systems Manager for the Development Services Center. And I'm here to actually show you today some of the fantastic results we are seeing from the largest citywide uh, re-engineering of processes and a business transformation that we have undertaken. This program started in 2015 and is called Project Eddy. Going the wrong way, sorry. Here we go. So this uh, program has been built on three pillars that have remained consistent in the city council's goals and objectives. The first is to build an iconic city. We are supporting this by facilitating development, making it easier for developers to come and build faster and increase value within our city. The second pillar that this is built on is to build a smart Las Vegas. We are facilitating online capabilities to make it easier for them to build and get their permits and licenses and all done online. So this is how we are ex accelerating that as well. And finally, to develop a customer-centric business focus. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I just heard you say a little while back that we are a customer-centric city. During my presentation, you will hear firsthand from some of our customers to show you how we are uh, achieving that goal. The business drivers for this program were derived directly from the City Council's goals and objectives. We set out in 2015 to become the best city for developers to invest in. And we did this by creating the best developer exper experience. We also set out to build processes for licensing, permitting, and planning that were better than any other city could simply buy. 
because of this, we, are, we have created now successfully a sustainable competitive advantage against other cities. We began the process by streamlining our div development functions, which meant breaking down departmental silos and making development as efficient as possible, which includes going online, but also making it easier to transition from one department of planning and then on to building easier. We decided to truly partner with our developers and not just be regulators. And what that means is working with them to see their development projects through for them. This is a short video that shows you one of the changes that we have made and it illustrates what we are doing. Let us start by looking at one example of how digital transformation has changed the way we work and serve our customers. Approving permits and planning applications requires city technicians to review a lot of paper. This process is not only burdensome on city staff, but requires builders, developers, and even homeowners to submit large volumes of paper plans that are expensive to print and hard to handle. This is the large, large plan with all of the, all of the common uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. This is the old set of drawings that needed to be corrected. And now this should be the final review. Once the permit is approved, building plans need to be kept on record for the life of the structure. This has created a large and expensive storage of paper dating back to some of the oldest construction projects in the city. But thanks to Project Eddy, all of this has now changed. With recently completed technology improvements, we are processing all plans, even the largest ones, electronically. Customers can now submit any permit and planning application online and upload all plans and documents 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not only does this save customers the cost of printing and delivering large volumes of paper, it allows various city staff to review the plans simultaneously on their computers, saving valuable time to approval of customer applications. It will be more efficient to, to not have uh, um, everything so cluttered and everything's organized on the computer and on, on our list of things to do in the order in which we need to do it. Reviewing plans electronically is just one of many Im improvements that we have made. As technology is automating more of the routine tasks, the city staff is now empowered to spend more time in helping developers make it through the development process. But let me give you one example. You saw Brian in that video carrying these plans back and forth from the plans library. They don't have to do that anymore, so they can spend more time on facilitating how to meet city code and helping developers get their permits issued faster. So the whole idea of all of this automation is that we facilitate and help customers more. We also, our field staff is spending more time now in the field uh, working with the customers as opposed to doing work in the office, which is a big plus. And you saw from Tom's numbers that we are doing over 100,000 of those inspections every year. The main thing that has changed is that through all of these change changes, the staff now feels empowered and a new can-do culture has emerged at the DSC. Next, let us take a trip with our inspection staff to see some of the process improvements being made in the field. Our inspectors have been equipped with updated equipment in the field, allowing them to share real-time data with contractors and homeowners. You'll be able to instantly see the results of your inspection. This saves valuable time, giving you immediate notification on how to remedy problems our inspectors may find. 
There is no more paperwork, all that has gone away, and efficiency is, is greatly improved, especially for the customer, because we can give them uh, results in real time uh, instead of waiting to the end of the day for them to find out what the results of their inspections are. Immediately when I input it and transmit it, they can see the, uh, the results of the inspection, see the corrections that need to be made, and they can do that and then reschedule their inspection most likely for the next day. So it really helps them and saves almost a whole day of their time. They enjoy it a lot more. It's more friendly to them because they can schedule most of their inspections online without having to go down to the development services center. And they can also get their inspection results via text messaging or email in real time. So as you can see, what are these benefits for the customer? From a customer and a development industry perspective, we now have the ability to do everything online. Not just the inspection results, but also any reviews that we are doing. As we are doing them, the customer can see what the issues are so they can start making corrections to those. We are also offering our dev developers a personalized customer dashboard. Many Contractors have dozens of uh, open permits at one time. They can see all of them at the same time on their dashboard. This is a huge help to our developers. And you'll hear in my next uh, short video from the customers on wh why they like that. We are also reducing the turnaround time for uh, reviews because instead of routing paper from one reviewer to the next, Multiple reviewers can now review all the permit plans at the same time. So we are streamlining the flow between the div uh, development function. So basically what we're doing is we're connecting the dots from planning to building also through in our licensing. And we are being more proactive. We are sending out emails to customers when there are potential issues which we weren't doing in the past, and now we are also telling them when there's an action requ required by them in an automated fashion. So much faster response time on all of this stuff. The goal of all of this is to make compliance easier, and the, and the outcome from that is that we are promoting public safety and welfare. So this is a short video of some direct feedback from some of our uh, customers. To see how our customers are receiving the changes we have made, we went to speak with them firsthand. Take a look at what they had to say. Monique O'Neill is the Starts Manager at DR Horton Builders and she is very familiar with the permitting process all across the Las Vegas Valley. And so I, I do appreciate that with a click of a button that we have a dashboard and it takes us directly to our plan check to see where everything is at. How we do? We have a online system um, called FileCloud, so it's just like prod, um, Dropbox or anything where our repository is at, mm -hmm. and that's where all of our building plans are at for our consultants, correction letters, um, initial submittals, and so all we'll do, which I like, is just upload directly from there. So that's the one great thing, and like and said, and it's, we're not constrained to having to leave. And I love how you guys even do the permits. The permits. Regular email, submit it. You get something that comes back and says, yep, we received it. Here's your um, number, so you can check through the process. It's mm -hmm. simple, and that's how it should be. Michelle Merrick is plans manager at KB Homes. When asked how our building department is doing, this is what she had to say. So I believe that the building department is working with the industry to make things easier for us. I think online submittal is one way, being open to suggestions, um, talking to the industry about what they could do better. Um, in the recent past, by not by going online, we don't have to spend as much time and resources driving down to the city, which takes a lot of time out of your day. Um, it's quicker, it's cost effective, because I don't have to print multiple sets of plans now. So it, it is an advantage to be able to just do it online. Do you feel that the city is working to help you get things done faster now? Yes, much faster. Because I know 
and they pride themselves on being more efficient, being on top. And I know with Kevin going in there, because him and I worked through Project Docs together at the county. Oh, okay. So we have that in common, and we know what we went through. Yeah. And then, so this, like I said, is much simpler. Okay. So awesome. that's what is great because I have a lot of people still coming into the industry who aren't technology savvy. Right. So the easier, the better. So as you can see, we are attaining that customer service goal. And uh, our online trends, his, historical trends over the last five years are showing that there is a greater and greater adoption of these improved processes. As you can see here, uh, the application fees that are being paid more online now than in, in person and in line. We are also seeing an increase in the inspections that are being scheduled online, either through our website or through IVR. And the building de uh, department applications online are also rising. There's a very important statistic to note here. 27% of our applications received are received now when the city offices are closed. Because we can do this online, we are getting more than a quarter of our applications because we can do this 24-7, 365. In licensing, we are seeing similar trends. Now, more than 80% of our license applications come in online. These changes and the drop in the need for customers to come to the DSC has led to a decline in the traffic at the DSC lobby, which I know all of you love because you know we have all these festivities there, but we are now looking to repurpose a lot of that waiting area because it's not being used, which is a really good sign. So the coming improvements, this is, I think, the crowning jewel of our project Eddie. You see, I'm going to give you an example of how we have created sustainable Im improvements. We, uh, when a civil perm permit goes through a final signature process, it has to be signed by these five companies. And this has to be done manually with paper plans being carried from one utility to the next. After they have been signed manually, then the developer can come to us and we can approve them simultaneously through our city departments. This process currently takes six weeks to complete. In those six weeks, they cannot start work. So in order to overcome this massive delay, we are looking to subsume all these utilities into our electronic signature process, which will allow us to complete this process in one week. That is an average saving of four weeks on over 200 projects a year. When I was speaking earlier about creating sustainable competitive advantage, this is the kind of process disruption that I was speaking about. And I can tell you no other jurisdiction has the technology and the capability to do this. That is why we will continue to forge ahead of the rest, rest of the cities. Uh, the road ahead leads to even more such process dis disruptions. We have built this capability for our developers to have this login and a dashboard. We can easily extend this to all the city residents, and that has to be yet funded and approved. We are looking for integration uh, with the Las Vegas Valley agencies to find even more opportunities to shorten the process. And we are also looking to work with private in industry to see how we can embed our government functions into their products and services. So there's a lot more to come here. And we are going to maintain Las Vegas as a leader in this uh, effort to keep us ahead of the rest. In closing, I just want to mention that this effort over the last five years has actually included more than 200 people, city staff, that have worked directly with me on this program. This is not all my doing. And this is not just IT, this is also the business side that PP people have really devoted their time and effort to re-engineering these processes with us. So it, it's really great to be able to stand here now because Rick gives this presentation annually since we started 
And a lot of it's about stuff that we're going to do. Now we're able to show you what we've done and what we're going to do. This next step is a top priority on my goals for this year, as it is uh, Rick and I working on this. Uh, he's obviously doing most of the work, but getting those utilities involved is, is a big deal. And if we do that, that is a game changer for us. But I want to I want to say that you know this process really is grounded in the direction and policy and leadership of the council, and it's fueled by the determination of Scott Adams and Jorge Cervantes to build community to make life better, which they drive into us every day. And the employees live that. They live our values of kind, committed, and smart. And your leadership team at the DSC is the best I've ever seen. They work collaboratively on projects. We go over things every week, all the big projects. And they are coming up with new ways to innovate and improve our service delivery and improve the quality and safety of our development. Mm -hmm. And it's just, a, it's just really, I mean, I, I see you all the time on all the big projects we talk about, but the stuff going on behind the scenes is really exciting and something that I'm most proud of and really excited to be a part of. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions, but really thank you for the opportunity to give you a brief update of the DSC and brag a little bit about what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Perigo. Thank you, Mr. Brick. Um, I have to just say I'm, I'm very excited about what I saw. Great job, Mr. Rick. I loved everything. I'm going to open it up to our council members. Councilman Knudsen. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you for the presentation. This is the area of the city that I'm the weakest in, so I've been, this has been a steep learning curve for me over the last several months, and I appreciate the patience, the staff um, uh, at the DSC and, and everyone really has been giving me. The area that I still have questions about is how the city's preparing around infill development, because that seems substantially different than like the development in Ward 6, um, which is a very nice area, but but not as pleasing as Ward 1. The best. <laughs> it's, it's the best. <laughs> Mine's the most aesthetically pleasing, honey. Ward, Ward 1 is competitive, <laughs> aesthetically wise. Um, but I, that's one area that I see as an opportunity, um, at least looking at it from my perspective, is the infill development is different than development in the open west. Um, and so from the developers that I've been talking to, the, the land use and zoning is incredibly important. And in, in Ward 1, there's some uh, more restrictive land use uh, zoning rules. Uh, and so that, I'm just curious about how, how we can be proactive. I've talked about it before from the empty big box stores. How do we, how do we re repurpose, rethink what those empty big boxes will look like? Um, and that starts from the land use and zoning, but obviously impacts um, what we're talking about here. So I'm just curious about your thoughts around how infill development will gets incorporated into this thinking. Absolutely, excellent question, Councilman. Um, so there's sort of two, two uh, levels uh, to, to, to respond. One is uh, the bigger uh, policy issues, the things that are being addressed through you know, the downtown 2045 vision plan, through the 2050 master plan, all that work, the new zoning through the form-based code. That's kind of the, the higher end uh, policy questions that we'll be addressing. The focus of this presentation is more on just the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of how do you get a project approved and through the system. And so in that regard, again, you're exactly right. The, the infill development creates the greatest challenges. But since we're seeing more and more of that kind of development, and we sort of showed that in the trends, um, we, we work really hard to overcome some of the issues. There's, there's all kinds of big challenges that, cr that cost time and money for these developments. So one thing that, that we're doing is uh, taking the entire leadership team once a month, meeting with a new business at their business, and they bring in their architect, their engineer, their builder, whoever, and we have a conversation. We, have, we, we, you know, we give them some business, you know, maybe we'll buy a beer or whatever, but we listen to them and they, they give us feedback on every issue they had getting that business open, and we're learning a lot. Um, and we, we're really grateful that the business owners and the, the folks involved are uh, being very transparent and open with us and telling us exactly what they think and what the issues were and how we can resolve them. And from that, we're already incorporating changes into our, into our business. Every, well, we talked about some of it in the past, but um, we're, we're making a lot of changes that uh, some of these things will come as policy questions to the council, uh, but a lot of it's changes in our processes and things that we just do administratively to help improve that. Um, you know, again, there are some issues with licensing, and we've got a whole big effort now. It, it really, that process sparked a major effort to look at some of our um, 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 license code and some of our zoning that goes with that and we'll be bringing those projects forward to you I think we briefed it uh, a week or so ago but yes we, we are absolutely focused on that and we are taking action 
consistently and continuously to, to address some of those issues. Thank you, Councilman Knutson. Councilman Anthony. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, th this is pretty impressive stuff. I mean, it really, it really is. Um, to have 80% of plants checked online is just uh, unbelievable. Um, and but I, I think the game changer is going from six weeks down to one week. I mean, that that's I don't think anybody would have thought that was would happen. So. Um, I guess what I'd like to hear is that you are approaching these companies that were on your PowerPoint and they are working with you. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we have had a lot of success with the ones we've talked to so far, which includes Southwest Gas, it includes the water district. And not only are they listening to work with us, they are looking to do what we are doing. And so, uh, so far we have not found any resistance, but if we do, I do hope to come to council to get your support to go to their management to push forward with this, because ultimately the pushback that we are getting is from large companies like Cox, because they are s for them we are a very small area compared to all the customers that they service. So they're saying, why isn't everybody else doing it? It's because we have built this capability to do it we have built this competitive advantage. Ultimately, we are looking to serve our developers and we are hoping that once we do it, that other ju uh, jurisdictions will also get on board with Cox. But they have, uh, they have worked with us so far. Okay. And if we get I pushback, mean, we will reach we out. We shouldn't have any resistance and if there is, then we all know who to call up here. So uh, <laughs> just let us know. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Seaman. I too am very impressed with what you're doing. And I may have missed this, but this streamlining process with the utilities taking six weeks to one week, when do we expect to see that happen? I'm expecting by the middle of 2020, mostly because we have a lot of red tape to cut through at their end because you know just giving them access to our software is not enough. We have to go through their IT departments and have to work with them to make sure that we're not vi uh, violating any of their controls and rules. Thank you so much for all your work. Sure, thank you. Thank you, anyone else? Okay. Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pratam. And so as a, I know that technology um, eliminates hurdles, but then when it works, it's fabulous. But then when there's a kink or it, the system goes down, then it's pandemonium, like it's not doing it. So I wanted to know if we had a plan B in place. So let's say, I don't know, something happens. Uh, and then I also wanted to know a little bit more about cy cybersecurity measures that we're taking to make sure that people's proprietary information is secure when they're sending us everything electronically. So if you could speak to those two, like what's our plan B when technology is in it, its greatest, and then um, how are we keeping people's information protected? Absolutely. Uh, as you know that IT has been working very uh, closely now to build our backup systems at switch extreme hi extremely high reliability of software but not only that we have fully redundant systems that are off-site so if our main site goes down within an hour or two we will have our backup sy sy systems to take over and these are not on site so it's not based on this site being up the other thing that you spoke about cyber secure security we've worked through with our secure security officer here in IT. We have also put in certain scanning that occurs on these files as they upload those files to us. So immediately if we find any objectionable content in those files, the files are quarantined immediately and they don't go into our software. So there is a whole bunch of um, gates that we've built to secure this. A lot of this online review of plans is actually being done in an online system called Bluebeam. Bluebeam is the world standard and we are like one of the smallest users of this massive cloud platform. So 
companies like that are way ahead of the game in terms of securing our capab capabilities. So we have taken every precaution possible to make sure that we will be safe. Awesome, and then one really quick follow-up. I remember touring all of the archives and the toe tags, and I'm so, I'm sure that staff aren't like completely upset that no more will be continued to be shipped their way because it's an impressive amount of documents and space that it takes. So what are we doing prospectively to, to save them? Are they in a cloud? Um, how long do we keep them? That kind of information. Just because sometimes things are coming up from, I don't know, the 50s and 40s, um, even you know, in our offices about we did this permitted and then we can't go back and find the record and then we have a dispute between what they say they did and what we are saying they're not doing. And so I just think it's important to keep um, everything just for us to refer back to for whoever's in the seat 20 years from now. They can kind of see where we were heading and why we did things the way we did today. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good question, Council, Councilwoman Diaz. I, um, we are using a system called AssetWise from Bentley Systems. It is a DOD cert certified document management system. That is the highest level of certification you can get on a document management system. And all these doc documents will live in AssetWise, and like I said, it is fully redundant, so we have a backup that's running right behind the main system in case something happens. All the documents that you saw in my videos is a massive backlog that still has to be addressed. What we have done so far is that we've stopped any additions going into that backlog. So we have curtailed the growth of that backlog, but because we have to keep some of these plans for the life of the building, mostly commercial buildings, we have to ultimately scan those documents into asset-wise. And that, uh, we've got estimates for that, we still don't have a uh, budget set aside. And it's probably gonna land up being a multi-year budget, but I'll uh, leave that up to city management to see how and when we can fund that. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, this was a report only. And now we will move on to item number 84. Very impressive, Mr. Rick and Mr. Perigo. We are going to set date on any appeals filed or required public hearings. I would instruct the city clerk to set the public hearing dates and appeals from the city planning commission meetings and dangerous buildings or nuisance uh, abatements. Will do, thank you. Citizen participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the City Council. No subject may be acted upon by the City Council unless that subject is on the agenda and is scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, come to the podium and give your name for the record. The amount of discussion on any single subject as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. This is your opportunity to address the council, but the council is not able to respond or engage in dialogue. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak under this portion of the agenda? Mayor Pro Temp, uh, Daniel Braisted, City of Las Vegas. Uh, while a handout's going out, I just want to remind people that Penn and Teller offer uh, passes to their show um, for the people that donate blood between well, tomorrow and the end of the year. They've been doing that for many years. Um, I attended the marathon homeless discussion in this room. I realized how little I knew about the courtyard. And I've been down there about four times. Uh, I've learned a lot. I met the supervisor in the parking lot and she gave me permission. She gave me her phone number to call on a Monday to set up a time to get more information. I called that Monday twice, I called that Tuesday twice, and I haven't heard back from her. I sought assistance, and the individ individual told me that she's too busy, so I'm offering to pay 
for a half an hour of her time. If somebody here can set up a time when I can go see what is actually going on down there. So I'd appreciate some information on that. Um, the handout that I put out <coughs> is just some items that I know you can't decide here, but I believe, I, well, I really don't know how your system works. I would really like somebody to publish something that if you want this road fixed, contact this person or do this, and I'd, I'd really help out. But these are some items that I know you don't have authority on, but I believe will help the community. Uh, I've also seeking to, I don't see a clock here. Um, do, do you want me to go over those or, or is it just enough in print to understand what I? I, I think, Mr. Breston, I think print is good. Great. Yeah. All right, thank you much. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday. Uh, is M Mr. Perez here? Okay. Good morning, City Council. My name is Marcos Alejandro Perez, and I'm here on behalf of the homelessness crisis that we have in Las Vegas. Uh, may I begin my speech? Absolutely, the clock is set for two minutes. Thank you. Our community has a very visible homelessness crisis on our hands. Everywhere we go, we see them in their struggle. It affects the homeless people themselves and our reputation as a city. Our goals as a community are the same. Less homeless people on the street because they're working and a strong tourist economy. What I'm afraid of is the issue will only get worse. But if there was a solution that was so effective that it boosted the local economy with new jobs and tourism capital, it cleaned our streets and our fresh water supply for our desert community, and was so efficient in decreasing homelessness that cities like San Jose, Little Rock, and San Diego extended the program because of its overwhelmingly positive results. We would need to pay attention to such a beneficial resource. San Diego implemented, excuse me, San Diego implemented a plan to kill multiple birds with one stone. Their city was plagued with trash and the 2008 recession skyrocketed their homeless rate. Their solution was to organize an infrastructure plan. They began by paying a small team of 20 homeless people minimum wage to pick up trash in the city. If the results were positive, the program would be expanded. If the program proved unsuccessful, it would be dismantled. As of April, there has been a 5.5% decrease in homelessness in San Diego, and tourism capital has increased by about $900 million, and the year still isn't over. Needless to say, these programs were expanded and are expected to become more robust as time moves on. Our ultimate question is, what is the most fruitful remedy to our homelessness issue? Should our solution be to give these people a chance to work their way out of their circumstances while serving our community, boosting our economy, and purifying our ecosystem? Or should our solution be to give someone with no money or place to sleep a new debt they won't be able to pay off, locking them in a place of perpetual poverty, struggle, and sadness? Our metropolis has an opportunity to excel and thrive with a cleaner reputation if we could help these people find our next step. Thank you so much, Mr. Perez. That was great. Anyone else wishing to speak on public hearing? Okay. Seeing none, we'll close that and we'll move on to agenda item number 86. Council member recognition, comments made by individual city council members during this portion of the agenda will not be acted upon by city council unless that subject is on the agenda and scheduled for action. So let's start with Councilman Creer. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Temp. Um, the Nutcracker, the Smith Center will host the Nutcracker performances until Christmas Eve. Uh, this is a family holiday outing. It is a magical journey through a larger than life world filled with waltzing flowers, nimble fairies, and moonlit snow. Uh, glittering holiday cheer abounds as Claire and her handsome prince travel from the warmth of her family uh, to the homeland of the toy soldiers. Uh, for tickets, visit uh, www.thesmithcenter.com. And don't forget that the ID requirements are changing. Beginning October the 1st, 2020, you'll need a real ID, comp, uh, compliant license, or other acceptable forms of ID, such as valid passport and U.S. military ID to fly within the United States. So to learn more about flying with a real ID, visit uh, tsa.gov slash real hyphen ID. And there's a call for artwork. The city of Las Vegas seeks to purchase multiple two-dimensional artworks to be permanently placed 
Within the newly renovated Las Vegas Senior Center, located at 451 East Bonanza Road, artists are encouraged to submit artworks for consideration, which directly represent the vintage Las Vegas. To apply, log in or create a new account using the City of Las Vegas Fine Art Exhibit Opportunity site and select Call for Artwork Las Vegas Senior Center. And I also just wish you a happy holiday greetings, uh, wonderful Christmas, happy new year, um, happy Hanukkah uh, for all that are out there, uh, happy Kwanzaa. And don't forget, you can always follow us on Twitter at Cedric Career, Instagram, Councilman Career, Facebook, Councilman Cedric Career. Happy holidays. Thank you, Councilman Career. Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I just have two events coming up in Ward 3. Um, and I think that we have something to visually show everyone, so I'm waiting for them to come up. There they are. Um, please join us this Friday, December 20th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at um, the East Las Vegas Community Center, where we're going to have uh, very special partners in this work um, come and get our hearts ready for Christmas. Uh, with a special visit from Santa Claus. We're gonna have um, toys to give away to our uh, community members and uh, fabulous circus acts and holiday musics and some goodies that are being provided by uh, my office. So please join us there at 250 Northeastern. And if you need more information, call us at 702-229-5428. I hope to see everyone this Friday. And then the um, last Christmas event that we'll host at the East Las Vegas Community Center is on uh, Christmas Eve, uh, Tuesday, December 24th, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this has been a tradition in our community for I think over 15 years. I, I really need to get the accuracy of how long it's been happening, but I know um, former newspaper owner of El Mundo, um, Eddie Escobedo Sr. was the one who started Navidad en el Barrio, and it's basically Christmas in the Barrio. Um, and it's another toy giveaway for young, um, young kiddos and families who m might be str struggling with making Christmas um, one that's happy for our kids. And so we're just encouraging everybody to, that needs that support to come out on uh, the day before Christmas, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at East Las Vegas Community Center at 250 Northeastern Avenue. Come celebrate the holidays uh, with this special event. And with that, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, uh, Happy Kwanzaa, all of the holidays that are coming um, in this season. And we will not be here to also wish you a happy, healthy, and productive 2020. And I hope that you spend it in good spirits and uh, surrounded by all those people who love you. Thank you, Councilwoman Diaz. Councilman Anthony. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Councilman Knutson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Happy holidays. Um, and I want to just remind everyone that there's still time to visit the Opportunity Village Magical Forest. It's operating daily until Christmas Eve in the heart of Ward 1. Thank you. And Councilwoman Senior. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I just want to let people know that our Small Business Sundays have been very successful, and we want to get the word out about your business. So please contact us at ward2 at lasvegasnevada.gov or call us at 702-229-2420. And we hope that you'll share your holiday with some great animals up for pet adoptions. Uh, we're going to bring them up on the screen. Mm. Nope, okay, uh, then we're gonna skip through that and I'm gonna say have a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy New Year. See you next year. Thank you, um, and we tomorrow, our next Golden Knights game, which is very, very important to support our Golden Knights, is Thursday, December 19th. The game starts at 7 p.m. Pacific time. There we go. Okay, there's our, there's our Go Nights Go. Okay, and then we are still in the month of December and our Christmas Fantasy Forest is um, still going on strong. Every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Santa Claus is there. Um, this Friday, he will be there from five to seven. Saturday, 
He'll be there from 2 to 5 and Sunday as well. What we're doing this Saturday is very important. We're going to be giving away a lot of Christmas presents to our children in Ward 6. So please join me um, at our Floyd Lamb Park this weekend to visit with Santa, take pictures, and pick up your Christmas presents. And then also, um, coming in the new year, we are going to be having a meet with Michelle on January 10th for some hot cocoa coffee and cookies uh, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's a Friday, January 10th, to start our new year together at our YMCA office. We have some great news. We have one of our missing children located, Paul Chavez, who was 14. He was a male. He has been located, thank goodness. Now we are looking for Christina Gibson. She's 13 years old. She's a female. She is African American. She's 5'5". She weighs 125 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. Christina was last seen in the area of North Las Vegas. Um, it is unknown where she is right now, so please, if any of you see beautiful Christina, call the North Las Vegas Police Department at 702-633-9111 or Nevada Child Seekers at 702-458-7009. We also have a parental abduction. Um, the infant was last seen with a non-custodial parent mother uh, and may be in need of medical attention. Last seen in the area of North Jones and uh, West Duncan Drive. The mother is 5'11". Uh, she's about 180 pounds, has brown hair and brown eyes. If you have any information about this infant, the infant's name is Willie Thomas. The mother is Katie Mosley, or the non-custodial parent. Um, please call Las Vegas Metro Police at 702-828-3111 or Nevada Child Seekers at 702-458. 7009. As we work with our Core Door of Hope and our homeless success stories, we have one. We are happy to announce, we don't have any pictures, but we are happy to announce that just a few weeks ago, the collaborative efforts from the Courtyard Case Managers, which are M-O-R-E, our more outreach teams, and partnered landlords achieved rewarding outcomes for families at risk and families experiencing homelessness. One of these cases involves an amazing couple who was working toward obtaining their own housing. Soon after they received help, the couple welcomed their first child, Lituna Falatikvag. Due to this help received by the courtyard, including working with their case manager, the family received approval to have custody of their newborn baby. These homeless uh, success stories just really warm my heart. And with that, we have Hanukkah coming up, so I want to make sure you guys have a happy, happy, happy Hanukkah and a Merry Christmas, um, a Happy Kwanzaa, a Happy New Year. And uh, for all of my colleagues, please do not forget your Christmas flowers and your Christmas presents. Merry Christmas to our staff. Thank you to our marshals, to all of our staff. You guys, we couldn't do what we do without each and every one of you and everything you do, we appreciate. And with that, we will be adjourning the meeting.